sat out in front of the church and gave out the candy like good witches do. Uh, it was a lot of fun. Darius, I saw you running back and forth across the street a couple of times, but you never came up here to get the spell cast on you by the good witch of Gold Hill. So I'll get you next year. Um, we are uh, so happy to have everyone here, except I left my notes, I think, at home. So bear with me. Uh, we still want to keep Hoppy lifted. I, I sent out an email about him and uh, my nephew and uh, just all of the churches and everything that we're going through. We have a lot of prayer requests, uh, not very many announcements today. So I just want to welcome you to Go Peel. Uh, if you have joined us online this morning for the first time, please let us know where you are from and how we best can pray for you. We do love to pray. We have a prayer shed that we usually get prayers from. We have one this morning we will be lifting up. Uh, we have a Tuesday morning prayer group, so if you ever have need of prayer, please either PM me on the uh, Facebook or contact me, and I'm being told that I can't be part of it. You'll have to come up here and look at some of my back. Um, and we had a wedding yesterday, so there might be some things, switches flipped the wrong way. <coughs> But we in Gold Hill, we are Wesleyan tradition. Uh, we honor the Wesleyan uh, motto to do good and to do no harm and to stay in love with God. Our prayer for the prayer box this morning um, comes from a place where we have all been before. Um, and I, I, this person wrote this at home and brought it to us because it's on purple paper. They, they must know the preacher. Whoever wrote this knows the preacher well. Um, but the prayer request is, please help us pray for peace as the family waits for the earthly passing of their dear mother. She is in great pain. She is ready to make a trip to her heavenly home. From the family's point of view, waiting is hard. So let us pray for this family right now. If you would lift your hands up. Father God, you know this family. You know the grief they are going through. And we have all sat in this position before. And we do know the desire for our loved ones to move on to glory with you. So Father, I ask that you give this family peace. We ask that you give them strength to endure the waiting and grief and help them to feel surrounded by your love. These things we ask in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> so it is so good to be in the house of the Lord with you today. Um, I can't believe I wrote all my announcements down and left my home. <laughs> so are there any announcements that anyone has?
So uh, if you can, if you're comfortable and you can help us that night, that would be great. What, what night what is that? It's the 20th, 20th. 20th. and then it, it should be in the bulletin. From 5:30 until 9. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The tickets are available if you're online or from some store if I have some. Okay. Well, we only printed three times this year.
So, so the Holy Spirit was here. Uh, I'm not sure how Darius communicated with this little woman that came into his shop, but uh, it was the Holy Spirit was here. We did touch hearts yesterday. So it, it was wonderful. And so Darius, for you and Vivian and the whole historic crew that put this event together, thank you for giving us an opportunity to reach out to the community. And next year, I need a few more goblins to sit with me, especially if it's as cold as it was yesterday. <laughs> I, I, I called you, Pam, and told you to bring me one of your blankets. It was so cold. I said, Pam, I'll never believe that I'm cold. <laughs> so now, if you are able, would you please stand? And our call to worship is printed in our bulletin. Uh, if you would stand and, and note that our first hymn, uh, I've scattered them throughout the sanctuary. <laughs> If you don't have one of these little books, pick one up. There should be one behind of you or beside of you somewhere. Uh, but our first hymn will be coming out of this hymn book on page 138.
very sorry because it was very powerful to sing this chorus and looking at Jesus shedding his blood for us. We are a blessed people. Amen? Amen. Let us um, affirm our affirmation of faith. Uh, it's on page 881 in your hymn book with our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his Son, our Lord, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. On the third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life.
and not knowing what we went to one room for or what we walked out the door for or where we're even supposed to be. There are just those days. And this is one for the pastor. So I really need you to show up. And we really all need you, Father, because we all are befuddled as we are walking this journey on earth. We, we, we have the faith that you're with us. We have the faith that we're going to be with you at the end. But it's all that in-between time, Lord. It's the day-to-day -day reckoning with ourselves and apologizing to you and asking forgiveness for one more thing. It's the things that we maybe have missed. It's the things we worry about that we don't need to worry about. Because I know my mother told me that 90% of what I worry about is never going to happen. And the other 10% is already taken care of. So help us to remember that, God, and, 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 and to place our worries on you and our anxieties on you to leave them at the cross. And many of us are very anxious about the ways of the world, God. Between COVID, that, you, that, that um, many of us believe is a man-made disaster for this world, and the disaster that's happening in some of our eyes in this country, we know that um, there's just some poor decisions being made, and it's making us anxious, Lord. So I'm asking that you please take this anxiety of the virus, take the anxiety of the nation's issues, Take the anxiety of the fear of the unknown away from us. Help us to remember that we are okay because you did come to earth and you did shed that powerful blood for us. You did cover us in your sacrificial blood. And, and in, in the end, we are going to be okay. But it's just today, Lord. We need to get through today. Father, I ask that you bless this family that left such a powerful prayer request in our prayer shed. We understand that, that <coughs> desire, the, the pain of saying goodbye, but the desire of that loved one crossing over and being in eternal bliss with you. We understand that. We have each been there. So we, we, we stand with this family, whoever they are and wherever they are. We ask that you be with our shut-ins, Shirley and Archie and Glenna and John, and, and help them to, to feel your presence, to feel your love, and, and help us to be a good church to them. Help us to love them well and let them know that we miss them and that they have not been forgotten. Father, we lift up everyone suffering from cancer, everyone that is going to be suffering from cancer. We especially lift up Hoppy and Graham, and we are claiming victory. We are claiming healing for both of these precious souls here on earth. But we do pray that your will be done. And, and, in, and in that, if your will is not for an earthly healing, God, Prepare our hearts for that. We, we ask for all that are suffering from COVID, that are fearful from COVID. We, we ask for all, I ask for safety for all the children that are being forced across our border and into um, human trafficking of, of one way or another. Father, there is a great evil across this nation, and, and we really need a revival in our land. And we need an awakening. We need you, Lord, to come with your mighty sword and, and, and open up our eyes as to what we can do. Because, Father, we, we just feel so helpless as we watch the news, as we hear the stories, as we get the prayer requests. It's just a, another need and more pain. So, Father, I just ask you, give us strength and strengthen our faith. Father God, we 
come before you grateful that on this Reformation Sunday, we remember our history as the Protestant Church. We remember that you are the, the holy, holy priest, and that because you came, we no longer need to, to give sacrifices on an altar. We no longer need to pay penance to a pope to get our, our sins forgiven. You have taken care of that, and you've wiped it all out. And we are thankful that Martin Luther nailed his 95 Theses on the Catholic door. And, and we are now a Protestant church that no longer has to go to confession to a priest and light a candle and leave a quarter to get our sins forgiven. We can come straight to you. We thank you, God, for that evolution in our denomination. And God, we, we pray for our church. We pray for the Capital C Church and for all the wrongs that have been done to all the people through the years, through, in the name of the church, Father God, I ask you to forgive us. And at this moment, we come to you with our personal petitions for prayer, with, with the pain that is so deep inside of us, we can share only with you and ask you to forgive us. And so we come to you now, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, as saved and redeemed people, we come to you, we sing praises to your name, we lift your name up on high, and we are ready for worship now. Help us as we go into this world to be kinder and gentler to those we meet. And help us to keep the words of your prayer on our lips all day, every day, as we meet those and remember the words that Jesus taught his people, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now, as forgiven and reconciled people, let us offer our gifts to God. Will our usher please come forward? <clears throat> As you are giving your gift in the offering plate, give a gift of welcoming with kind words to someone near you. This is your permission to talk in church.
yesterday and today, I don't know, but mm. whatever. Um, the scripture that I read today from Hebrews, I don't know if you read that often, if you think about the words that it says. Now, the first 10 verses I did not read of Hebrews that leads up to this text, and I'm not going to dwell on, but we do just kind of, I want to get the picture in your mind of what's going on here. Those first 10 scriptures, they basically are describing the decor of the inside of the tabernacle. And we know at this time in the Old Testament, the tabernacle was a tent. And that, that is why he referred to the tabernacle as built a tent built by human hands, earthly hands, I believe is the word he used. Um, so this, we're still in the traveling tabernacle, the tent that they set up and that they move with them wherever they went. And we have to understand um, in that no one was allowed into this tabernacle but the priest, the high holy priest. And so on the outside of this tent is where people would come with their gifts and um, the, the priest would accept the gifts and then they would take it inside. And, and inside of what is called the holy place, there's really like a tent inside the tent. And inside of this first area here, there's a golden lampstand, and there's a table, and there's what they call the bread of presence. And then you go through that into the inside tent, and that's called the most holy place. It is what well, is referred to in Scripture as the holy of holies. And inside of this holy of holies, there is an altar. I don't think it looked like our altar, but there was, there is an altar, and on that altar there is incense. There's a bowl for incense, and there is the Ark of the Covenant, which I I believe is in, to be bigger than than our altar that we um, that we have here. And that that Ark of the Covenant has been covered with gold. Uh, if you go back to Exodus in chapter 25. Uh, God commands Moses how to build this Ark of the Covenant, much like he told Noah how to build the Ark. He, he tells Moses how to build it, what to build it out of, and how big to build it. And then after it's built, he tells him that inside of this Ark, he is to place a pot of manna. Now, I have always wondered, is this the same manna that... that that they gathered as they were crossing the desert, maybe on the last day or something, because that manna's got to be wormy and moldy. I, I'm just thinking. I don't know how that could be holy, but because it's in the ark, maybe God just keeps it fresh. I don't know, and we, we probably won't know that until we get to heaven. But inside of this ark is a pot of manna from crossing of the desert, and the book of law that Moses wrote, we know of as the Torah, and the Ten Commandments. Um, I don't know how they carried those. I, I just, we're not told these things, but you know those, those tablets had to be heavy, uh, and they carried them with them everywhere they went. <clears throat> and also, beside of the ark is Aaron's staff. And if you remember your Old Testament history, the staff, uh, it, it, when Aaron, Aaron was, took over from the staff bloom. It had an almond bloom on it, and it still had that almond bloom on it. My flowers never last that long. Only jams last forever. Mine don't last that long. <laughs> so Aaron's staff was laying there with this beautiful almond bloom on it, and standing over the ark were uh, cherubim. And, and they, they, were, they had their wings spread, and they're looking at each other, uh, kind of over, and in the middle of the two cherubim uh, is, is what God called the mercy seat. And, and it was to be the exact place on that mercy seat, these two cherubims, and here's the mercy seat, and it's right there between the cherubim. That's the exact place where God's going to meet his people. And in verse 22, God says, You shall put a mercy seat on top of the ark, and in the ark, you will put the testimony that I shall give you. I interpret that, that God told Moses what to write for, those, for the Torah. There I will meet you, 
And from above the mercy seat, from between the two cherubim on top of the ark of testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for these people of Israel. So you can see why this Ark of the Covenant was very important to these people. Now, our, our high priest could enter that, uh, I mean, only a high priest could enter that Holy of Holies where this Ark was with all the history from Moses in it. And he would go in there one day a year. It was, this is a very special uh, uh, feast that, that the Israelite people celebrated. And, and it was just about three weeks ago when, when, for the Day of Atonement. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies three times on that day. The first time he would go in to fill the Holy of Holies with smoke so that there would be something between him and God to, to put a barrier between. And the second time that he went in there, he went in to sprinkle and offer the blood of the bull. Priests had to be sanctified by the blood of a bull. Uh, and, and then finally, the last time he would enter, he en entered with the blood of a goat. And that was to sanctify all the people that were standing around outside. Now, there's all kinds of details about this that we're not going to go into today. I just want to give you a picture of what's happening and what, what we, he, Paul was writing about here. Um, <clears throat> they're not the point of the message today. Our point, my point, I want to focus on the blood of that goat. That goat, can you imagine being sanctified by the blood of a goat? And, and, and that blood of that goat it was sprinkled on the ark. Apparently the ark was opened and it was sprinkled on the tablets inside of it, the Ten Commandments. And, and the blood of that sacrifice, because he sprinkled it on, on the tablets, which is the law. Those are the ten biggies we're not supposed to do. So it was sprinkled on that law. That was the law. That's telling us what we're supposed to do and not do, which we're all sinners, so we have broken just about all of those laws in one way or another. So, so the idea is he put the blood of the goat over the law, blocking, putting a barrier between the people on earth and God. And that was to cleanse us so that, that the sins, so that we would not be judged by these sins that we could not keep from doing. The blood of that sacrifice, it was believed, created a barrier between God's law inside the ark and God's people outside the tabernacle. And, and that blood, according to God, was what was required for all of their sins. For the people outside. And so, so this day of atonement is one of the most solemn holy days of all the Israelite feasts and festivals. Most of us have not researched our Judeo-Christian history enough to really have a full grasp on what all that means and what is really happening here. And we certainly did not live in that culture 2,000 years ago. So it's kind of hard for us to understand how the blood of a goat can save us from our sins. But, but if, you, if you want to study that more, I will help you point you in the directions. But I just want you to understand what is going through the mind of the Israelites 2,000 years ago. They've got one day to get themselves cleaned up and to try to make the next year right before it comes around again. So I, it's really hard to explain this, um, it's hard for me to understand. So I want to share with you an image that was shared with me that I believe paints this Day of Atonement much better than I can. I was told to imagine a huge stone wall. It could be like the beautiful foundation of our church or the wall across the street. It could be smooth granite that our Bank of America is built on. Whatever is beautiful in your mind, imagine that stone wall. And, and that, that stone wall is not here on earth. That stone wall is up in heaven. And that's what God is looking at. When he looks at us, he sees that stone wall. And, and each time on our own wall, we've all got a wall. And every time we sin, there's a chisel, a magical chisel, 
that etches in the rock, recording how we have broken God's commandments. Every time we covet things that, that God has not given us, that chisel just chisels away. Every time we gossip or spread rumors or, or speak poorly of our neighbor, every time we take what's not ours or we hold back something that, that could help a neighbor or, or we act uh, selfishly or ungenerously, the chisel goes to work. Every ugly word, every impure deed, Every ounce of anger is recorded there on that wall. Every time we disobey our parents or we rebel against the authorities that God has placed over us, that chisel starts banging. That's a record of our sins against our neighbors. But our sins against God cry out even more. Missing opportunities to gather with believers on a regular basis. Setting God's word aside. I will get to this later. Re neglecting to, to regularly and often say our prayers and commune with God one and one. Fearing, which is, I'm fearing a little bit today instead of trusting and having faith. Every time we let our fear become stronger than God's love. And we trust in everything over and above God. I mean, we have to know there's not one bill, not one law that our United States Congress can pass that's stronger than God. So why are we worried about all this? But when we do, all of this comes before the Father. And, and, and it cries out for justice and a punishment. This is the accusing work of the Ten Commandments. They accuse us, and I stand guilty of all of them. It doesn't matter if you feel guilty or not. You are guilty. And, and in fact, if you don't feel guilty, there's some more chiseling going on. Because we are all sinners. And, and if you don't feel guilt for your sin, there are marks being made against you. When a convicted criminal has no remorse or feelings of guilt for the sins for which he or she is guilty of, it is good and right for the punishment for that person to be harsh, a little bit harsher than maybe the criminal that does feel guilt and remorse for what he has done. What the high priest has done for you and me, he entered into the holiest of holies, not, not a tent made by man on earth. He, he entered into the holy of holies on the day of atonement. And he, the, the, the earthly priest, he offered the blood of goats on our behalf. Every year, that sacrifice was required. Every year. Because it was just a goat. And, and so this sacrifice had to be redone over and over and over. But the problem with it was maybe Day of Atonement, you got forgiven, and the next day you just did something terrible. It's going to be another year before you could ask forgiveness for that. It always had to be refreshed and touched up with another sacrifice. So every day on the Day of Atonement, the high priest had to go through all of that again. But now, now, a thousand years later, the people are being told that Jesus, our great priest, has come. And, and he has not come into the Holy of Holies inside of the tabernacle, but he has come into the heavenly courtroom. And Jesus still has the scars on his hands and in, in his feet, and in his side. And Jesus is walking with a bowl full of blood, like that priest had a bowl of goat's blood. Jesus has a bowl of blood. The difference is, this blood is his blood. It is not the blood of a goat. And he, it 
was drained from his body. He's the one that suffered and died, not a goat. And he takes that blood to your wall and to my wall, that wall that has been chiseled out with my sins and your sins. And he takes that blood because we come to him on our knees at night or in the morning or at lunchtime. Whenever we, we, we truly repent of whatever it is we just did, he takes that bowl of blood and, and he sees those marks and he pours that blood over the marks until all the marks are completely covered out. And now, when the Father looks at that wall, instead of seeing a record of our sins, he sees his son's blood. He sees the blood of Jesus. He does not see one evidence of our sin. Is nothing is visible to him that we have done wrong. Every sin is covered by the blood of a sinless man. Everything that we have done that deserves God's punishment, because let's face it, we all deserve punishment of the worst of the worst, has just been covered by the blood of Jesus. That's the picture in this text that I just read to you this morning. Look again at verse 12, if your Bibles are open. Jesus entered once and for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing eternal redemption for us all. Our sins are forgiven. And the perfect righteousness of Jesus has been given for us. And this final promise gift for mankind happened not in a tent made by hands on earth. Instead, this transaction took place once for all eternity in the reality of our heavenly courtroom, the temple made by our creator, the one that created us, not with human hands. Jesus took our place. We understand that. But we really don't understand that. This is one of those mysteries of our faith. We understand, but we don't understand. And thank God, he told me, we don't have to understand at all. We just have to believe. And we are all believers. He endured the wrath of God that you and I deserve. And because he did this, he secured an eternal redemption for you. His sacrifice, His shed blood, it is presented before God the Father, who according to Jesus, in our gospel lesson in John, He is the judge, and God Himself declares you not guilty. Because of what Jesus our Savior has done, we have eternal redemption. And according to Jesus, as we keep and believe on His word, we will never taste death. And if you have ever been where these people are, if you've ever held the hand of one who is dying, you have seen peace on their face as they drew their last breath. And you know they did not taste death. They took the hand of Jesus, and it was beautiful. Now the text plainly says that we have eternal redemption, unending, ceaseless, endless. It's eternal redemption forever and ever. Amen. But there is another statement here that shows the extent of this redemption. Look at 13 and 14. And as you hear this, think back on that sacrificial worship in the Old Testament. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify or make holy for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, <clears throat> who through the eternal spirit, <clears throat> who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, how much more will we be purified in our conscience? Look carefully at what the text is saying here. How much more will the blood of Christ purify our conscience than dead works? Now, I would expect that text to say that Jesus' blood purifies my conscience or my sins, my 
iniquities or transgressions, but it doesn't say that. It could have said that because it does do that. But 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 Paul's intent here was that that it the the blood of Jesus purifies us from every sin that troubles our consciousness. It says that it purifies our conscience, that deep inner part of us, from dead works. What are these dead works? Do you ever think about the words that you, you read in scriptures or that we sing in these hymn books that were written in the Victorian age almost? When I was interpreting on Sunday mornings for my uh, hard of hearing friend, um, I, I really gave my dictionary and a thesaurus a workout because when you when you interpret for the deaf, you have to find meaning. Not it's not just a word for word translation. You have to understand what that word or that phrase means, and then you have to paint a picture of what that means. And there were a lot of words in 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 these two books I didn't understand. And if you understand all of them, you need to be up here in my place. And I had to study. And I will tell you, I dug, I dug deep. I had to go deep to find out how to interpret and paint this picture for my friend. And, and dead works was one of those. It was like, what in the world does this even mean? Because if I would have interpreted dead works, she would have been very confused. And, and so I had to figure out what, it, what is he trying to say in this scripture. And then I had to paint that picture. For believers, Jesus has paid it all for our sins on the cross. And we are washed completely clean by the blood of Jesus. We are totally forgiven and we are made fully right with God by faith through grace alone. A dead work is any work that is done forgetting that God came for us and did it all for us and qualified us. A dead work is anything that we do in an attempt to be right with or to maintain our right standing with God. An attempt to clean what has already been cleaned, marking that work useless. And, and we know we can't do that. I, I, have to, I think I've shared this before, but on the night that my mother died, Many of you know she lived with us for 32 years before she died. And in the mornings, I would go downstairs and I would ask her, Mom, do you want to shower or do you want a bed bath today? It would depend on how she was feeling and how much energy and strength she had that day. And, and that night when she died, uh, she so sweetly came into my dreams. And she was laying in her bed, but she looked like she was 30, 35 years old. She was beautiful. And um, she was covered with dazzling white sheets. She was laying in the bed with those dazzling white sheets laid over her. And I remember I walked down the stairs and in her room and I said, Mama, do you want a bed bath or do you want a shower today? And she just turned her beautiful face to me and she says, I don't need either. I've been clean inside and out. And, and I, I, I believe, you know, she was. That's, that's God's work. There's, there's no amount of bathing I could give my mother that was going to clean her like that crossing over cleansed her. And so, so she has been cleaned inside and out. And that, that is the perfection that we are all striving for. That's where we're trying to go. Jesus tells us in chapter 2 that works without faith are dead. Jesus has all, it's like, it's like bathing that same person every day and getting, getting the sweat off every day. And it's going to be back again tomorrow. Only God can clean us inside and out. Today is Reformation Sunday. And I, I think today's scripture is what was behind Martin Luther nailing those 95 theses on the Catholic Church in 1517. You see, in the Old Testament, people had to pay the priest to sprinkle blood on their behalf. And the early Catholic Church carried that tradition with them for the next three, 4,000 years, or 2,000 years after Jesus died. People had to pay what's called indulgences to the priest, I mean to the Pope, to be forgiven. And Martin Luther knew, we've already been forgiven. Our priest is the high priest. He is in the Holy of Holies. We don't need to come and pay you and, and if you don't know, 
part of the Reformation was about the popes 2,000 years, 1,000 years ago. Popes were more wealthy than many kings because we paid indulgences to them to forgive our sins. And Martin Luther, he knew that was wrong. And so the big division from the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church began. We know, like Martin Luther, that there is nothing that we can do to make God love us more. There is nothing that a pope or a high priest can do for us that Jesus has not already done. The price has been paid, and we just have to believe, we just have to hold out our hands and catch those mercy drops that he's pouring down on us. His sacrifice on that cross cleanses us inside and out. And even the good works that we try to do, according to this text, are dead works. We cannot atone for our sins. The only hope we have for a clean conscience is the blood of Jesus. He died for our sins and he died for our dead works. And we can never make up in the ways in which we have failed him all of our life. But he doesn't care. He forgives us and he never sees them again because they've been covered by his blood. So we don't have to recognize this day of atonement anymore because every day in the life of a Christian is a day of atonement. Every day. But it's important that we remember that it hasn't always been this way. We do need to know our history. And it's important to remember the saints that live before us paving this way. And it's important to remember a Savior that died so that we can all live. It is important to always remember the amazing grace that was given to us on the cross. Amen? Amen. If you are able, will you please stand and join us in the red hymn book on page 378. And we, we're going to sing the first four verses.
Let us leave this place knowing we have met that Jesus again today. That we are walking out of here with his power, with his grace, and with his love into God's world to do some kingdom building in his name. Amen. Amen.